But what is more important for the patient is, are we buying something with mucosal healing? Is this buying them some mileage? Okay. So these are data from uh, Paul Rutgers in our group. He looked in a post hoc analysis in circumstantial evidence, but it, take it for what it is, at patients for hospitalization and surgery. In orange, these are the patients that demonstrated no healing in the ACT-1 trial, so the pivotal maintenance trial with infliximab. Those patients showed uh, healing at one of the uh, scopes after initiation of therapy. The patients with 0% surgery and hospitalization had healing at two scopes. So it's not direct evidence, but we're getting close to showing that, yes, it's relevant to heal the mucosa, and we should probably not be content just with symptoms. Do we have data from ourselves? Well, these are data from Leuven that were published in IBD by Fabian Schnitzler, a fellow from uh, Munich that was working with us. And what you can see here is that in yellow, the patients with mucosal healing, there was uh, a better uh, avoidance of major abdominal surgery also in our cohort. Mind you, it was particularly true for patients with scheduled treatment, not so much for episodic treatment. So again, I think a case to treat patients in maintenance. And what we also observed is that those patients that stopped infliximab, uh, uh, the major abdominal surgery rate was still down. So those patients that could stop infliximab while being in remission, uh, it was sort of a long-lasting effect uh, the, in those patients. So it seems to be that uh, we're, we're saving surgeries. <coughs> this is an interesting French trial you all heard of. Well, it's not a French trial because the first author is Belgian, but you know there's some overflow between the two countries. Um, <laughs> What you see is that the STORY trial, what they did is a infliximab interruption trial where they stopped patients who did well at, at, with at least one year of infliximab. They didn't have a control group, which is a little bit of pity, but take it for what it is, I think it's, it's, it's a courageous effort to do this trial. What you see is that after a year, about 57% of, of the patients uh, were still uh, needed infliximab again. So you could say like, well, half of the patients needed infliximab. Uh, so should we stop it? I mean, this is some debate is still going on. Maybe we should try in a certain cohort of patients, and I think this is important in this trial. Those patients with a um, ongoing inflammation mucosal, uh, mucosal lesions were more likely to, to need infliximab after one year than those with complete healing. Um, there's something peculiar to the trial, and this is not a mistake, and we, we can discuss that afterwards. Those with high trough levels on infliximab were having a higher likelihood of relapse. Something counterintuitive, but I have some ideas that there's a reason for this. So let's switch to ulcerative colitis. You, you think, well, UC is a much simpler disease. Let's not treat Crohn's disease anymore. UC is much simpler. Well, this is a patient diagnosis of UC, initially left-sided, treated with 5-ASA. Cyclosporin in 2004 for a severe pancolitis, and we could bridge him to azathioprine, and it was doing well after. And then we scoped him for surveillance in 2010, and he was reporting no symptoms. Sure enough, this was his colon. So you will agree with me, Mayo 2, there's erosions. There's, there's always a debate between the Mayo 1 and the Mayo 2, but I think the erosion show us that this is Mayo 2. So what should we do? Intensify the therapy? Leave the guy alone? I don't think I have the clear answer. Let, let, let us look at the data. For, for ulcerative colitis, it's simpler. Most of the drugs that we think are efficacious for UC are inducing rapid and important mucosal healing. Azotriper and even no, no direct data, but some indirect data that is doing the same thing. And it's generally accepted as an endpoint for UC. Why? I think there are several reasons. Only sigmoidoscopy is needed to judge the mucosa. We don't have to prep the patient fully. We don't have to sedate them for ileocolonoscopy. I told you this one already. And also, we believe, and I think it's true, that UC is not a transmural disease. So the complications of strictures and abscesses are not yet there. So we, we think that if we heal the mucosa, we've controlled the full disease, where that's less clear in Crohn's disease. So I'll show you in our, the arguments pro intensifying the therapy in our 51-year-old male, one of it would be that mucosal healing predicts the long-term outcome. These are two sets of data. The first is from Oxford, when Sidney Trulov was still working there. 40% of patients, so you see it's 1966, it's uh, the previous millennium, but it's still true. 40% of patients with endoscopic healing stay in remission 
for one year versus 18% with no healing. And this is the Epson cohort from Norway. You know, this was an inception cohort where they followed patients from a certain, so it's, it's population-based. And what you see, of course, this is only 0.9 here, so not all the patients had colectomies. But there is a difference in the Kaplan Meier curves with those patients achieving healing and not achieving healing. So it predicts the need for colectomy. And this is our data that was put out by Mark Ferrante uh, in JCC of our infliximab cohort with UC. And again, you see here, uh, red are the patients with no mucosal healing, yellow those with mucosal healing, that the risk of colectomy increases when you don't achieve short-term mucosal healing. But there's a problem with UC. Our patient was probably a Mayo 2 or on a barren scale moderate disease. These are the criteria that are used amongst the different scaling systems for, for uh, UC. But the clinical trials differ. For example, for a lot of the 5ASA trials, complete healing was considered mucosal healing. Whereas in ACT1 and ACT2 for infliximab, both mild disease and just no, no inflammation left in the mucosa was considered endoscopic remission. So we have to be careful not to compare apples and oranges here. Um, there is degrees of mucosal healing and we shouldn't mix them up. So it's important, I think, if you go back to ACT1 and ACT2, and if you, I think you've been presented by that by Centocor several times, is that you look at those patients with no endoscopic lesions. And there again, you see that I think uh, I'm convinced that for UC, uh, anti-TNF agents, specifically in Fliximab right now, is working because you see, again, a difference for the score zero at week eight and week 30 between placebo and both uh, dosing levels of the drug. So this is a clear indication, in, uh, from my respect, that it's doing something. Is it predicting something? Well, this is, again, a post-hoc analysis that Paul Rutgers put out showing you that those patients with mucosal healing after eight weeks, so the short-term endpoint, we're more likely to be in clinical remission afterwards. So again, it predicts the course of disease in UC. And this is data with 5ASA, Italian data. So it's not specific to the biologicals. In the Norwegian Ibsen cohort, people were not using biologicals. It was steroids, topical, 5ASA, topical and systemic. So they were not using any, um, any infliximab in those days. So you see again, if you achieve clinical remission with endoscopic healing with a 5-ASA compound, a year later, you're much less likely to have flared as those patients that achieved only clinical remission. So an extra argument. Do we have other arguments for our patient to treat him more extensively because he did not heal his mucosa? Well, there is the notion of histological healing. But now I'm getting a little bit on quicksand here. I'll show you the data. The problem with histological healing is that it's slow and it's not been generally accepted in an, as an endpoint in clinical trials. And I think at this time we should keep it that way. Persistent inflammation and basal plasmacytosis in patients with clinically quiescent UC predicts relapse. Data from Oxford, 1991, and from Alain Bitton, who's now at McGill, when he was working in Boston. Persistent histological inflammation is a risk factor for colonic dysplasia. There's three sets of data showing that right now. This is Alain's work, Alain Bitton's work, where you see that presence of basal plasmacytosis predicted the relapse in patients with UC. This is data from Matty Rudder when he was working uh, at St. Mark's. He's now somewhere in the middle of the UK. But you see from his data that both endoscopic and histological scores were lower in those patients without uh, advanced neoplasia in the St. Mark's uh, surveillance program. And actually, a small increase of one point in the histological score predicted a five-fold increase of the risk of neoplasia. So there is, there is, there is something there. If you have ongoing histological inflammation, it makes sense, right? But you need to show it also in prospective trials. And this is data from the US showing you again that the mean histological scores was uh, lower in those patients with any neoplasia, was 1.4, versus the advanced neoplasia, you see that histological score in the surveillance program was much higher. Also, what predicted advanced neoplasia was the number of scopes. So we do have still a sampling error with our surveillance programs, but I'm not going to discuss that today. Again, data, data from Dave Rubin showing you that more severe inflammation uh, was associated with neoplasia 
in their pathologist blinded case control review in Chicago 2.73 ulcerates you.